Hello, and welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella. And I'm your better, prettier, younger host, Tori. We're sisters who are obsessed with true crime and love gal palin with you about cases. You can expect the occasional curse word, lots of friends quotes, and all the 90s nostalgia. To get in on the conversation, check us out at KillerQueensPodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Killer Queens Podcast, And we're on YouTube at Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. Okay, y'all, grab your Capri Suns or your Surge and let's talk about some true crime. Welcome. Hey, guys. I have a bit of a story. Okay. Yeah, I already just told it to you, but now I want to tell it to everybody. Um, So if you've been a longtime listener of Killer Queens, the show where everything's made up and the points don't matter, which actually means the show where we are stuck in the 90s and early 2000s and we'll never get out of them. (laughs) I used to, and it was really stupid that I did this, but... In our early episodes, when we got to, like, double digits, like, when we got in the 20s, I called it, like, 2D1, 2D2, which was dumb. And then in the 30s, I called it, like, 31, 32, which is dumb. 40s was a little bit better because of some fart T1. I went with farties. Yes. Which I thought was fun. It's the only forgivable. Yeah. And then once we got to, like, 120, whatever, I forgot about it. And even 220, whatever, I forgot about it. Today is episode 231, mm-hmm. but what is really funny is, um, again, if you've been a longtime listener, you may have even heard my youngest son, Jesse, when I was on maternity leave with him, just his little baby breathing. I believe it was in the Alice Ruggles episode, mm-hmm. and he was just, I, I had him, I was like wearing him in a, like a little baby wearing thing when we recorded, but anyway, that guy is four years old now, and... The other day, he's trying He's trying to learn how to tell time. He wants to go. He, basically, what he does is try to argue that, no, it is, in fact, not bedtime, even though, Mom, you think it's bedtime. Let me go tell you what time it is. And then he's like, that's not my bedtime. And I'm like, yeah, the fuck it is. You're supposed to be in bed right now. So he was going <laughs> over trying to tell time. And he's like, it's 8 two, 2 And he's like, 8 2 2 And he thought it was so funny. And I was like, I know, right? <laughs> That's how you say it. He's never heard me do that. <laughs> it's cute when a four-year-old does it. When a oh. 34-year-old does it. Now you're just being kind. Well, at the time <laughs> that you were doing that, it was you were 34 probably. I was younger than that. Oh, I don't know how I don't know how the hell old you are. Yeah, I'm definitely 36. So get your maths right. I know that. Um Yeah. So anyway, I just thought I would say it's not just me. It may only also be children, but still not just me. (laughs) Well, okay. Yeah. So I thought that was important to get out of the way. All right. Well, I'm glad you took the time to do that. Thank you. As long as you feel good about it. You know what I do? All right. Um, Now we're going to get into some sad things. Yeah. So we've got some trigger warnings for this episode. Um, absolutely brutal murder, multiple child murders, drug use, a lot of infidelity, mm-hmm. um, dickhead central. Yes. Yeah. And, um, what about our window open? Let's, let's think, let's think, let's think. Hmm. How angry are we going to get here? I don't know. There's going to be parts where I'm pretty angry. I think you're going to want it open at the very least. Yes. Make sure it's open. You don't want to break that glass when you throw all your shit out the window. No. Yeah. And thanks to Jody Weinmiller, Christina Bailey, Linton McLean, Jackart. Jackart. You know what? I'm just so sorry about all of this. If it's wrong, I'm so sorry. And Sarah Rice. Yay, thank you. For requesting and it. Did I say that? You did not. Okay, that's why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For requesting it. And thank you to Madison for writing it up. Yes, thank you. Yes. And so I'm going to give a little overview. Okay. Okay. On February 17th, 1970, 26-year-old Jeffrey McDonald called 911 saying that there'd been a stabbing at his home and people were dying. McDonald, a Green Beret, lived on the Army base in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Military police quickly responded to the McDonald house to find a horrific scene. 
26-year-old Colette and the McDonald's two daughters, five-year-old Kimberly and two-year-old Kristen, had been stabbed and bludgeoned to death. Mm. McDonald, however, was still alive with only minor injuries. His story quickly began to unravel to investigators as he continued to blame the murders on a group of intruders whom he described as (laughs) drug-crazed hippies. Sure. Was McDonald telling the truth or had he murdered his family in a fit of rage and then staged it to look like a copycat Manson murder? This is like actually pretty timely in the sense that we just covered Charles Manson. Yeah, I was going to say, we we planned the timeline. Well, we didn't plan the timeline, but no. it lined up just so to where it's completely relevant for. Yeah, it's literally case. none of our business what the timeline looks like. Everybody mm-hmm. else picks that for us and we thank you for it. Yes. All right, so let's get into who were the McDonald's. Jeffrey Robert McDonald was born in Jamaica, Queens, New York City in October of 1943 to Mac and Dorothy McDonald. He had two siblings, Judy and Jay. Oh, they're a Jay family. Mm-hmm. But Judy, Mac McDonald, Jay, Jeffrey, and Dorothy. But you know, you know, I went to high school with a girl whose name was Lindsay. Her mom's name, I think, started with a J. Her dad's name started with a K. Her name started with an L, and her brother's name started with an M. They were like, oh, J-K-L. M. I mean, I assume if they'd had more kids, they would have had a Nate or something. Yes, they would have just gone down the alphabet. Yeah, I've never put that much... I don't know. I'm just like, whatever. Although... Andrew and my initials are T and A. Uh, that's my favorite thing that can ever. That be exciting. No, I always, anytime somebody's like, hey, what are you doing today? I'm like, I'm going to T and A's. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's us. All right, but Jeffrey's mother described him as a kind, agreeable kid with a sunny disposition. She said that her son was always interested in athletics and being a well-rounded student. He participated in the school's music program and student council. And he attended, I don't know how to say this, Patchog? I was going to say Pacho- uh, Pachog. Pachog? Pachagu. Pachagu. I don't know, though. I think we've said all the, you know what? I bet we've said all the ways you can say it except the way you actually say it. Right. You know, that's how New York is, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they really got us with Chai Lai. Oh, my. I mean, they really, they're still laughing about that one. Oh, yeah. There's so many, like, cities and counties and all these things in New York that it's like, how do you think this is pronounced? And then it's like, yeah, you fucking idiot. (laughs) I know. Just kidding. Psych. Yeah, I have no idea. I I think the reason why I thought Patrick U was because I just rewatched for the 11 millionth time. Montague. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hopefully one of those is right. If it's not, super sorry. I mean, we live in Tennessee. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. But at his high school, he was voted most likely to succeed and most popular. While in high school, he dated the same girl on and off. Colette Stevenson was born on May 10th, 1943 in Mapachagu, New York. (laughs) I, I just, I don't know how to say it. She enjoyed the arts, music, movies, books, and her classes. And she wanted to get a degree in English literature because she wanted to become a teacher McDonald and Colette met each other in middle school, where his mother said that he was very enamored with Colette. Oh, enamored in middle school. Yeah, but then, I don't know. Fuck him. I'm so annoyed with him. I can't even deal. I'm not saying that Colette didn't deserve to be enamored with. I'm saying he's just an asshole. Yes. Later, when Dorothy was asked to describe her daughter-in-law in in one word, she said that she was, quote, delightful. That's sweet. Especially for, I mean, you know, sometimes the... Mother-in-law, wife situation can be difficult, but yes, it's great. Uh, Jeffrey and Colette dated on and off throughout high school before he earned a scholarship to Princeton University in New Jersey. Princeton, that's where the princes go. That's it. New Jersey seems an interesting place for that. Like, I thought it would have been anywhere other than New Jersey. <laughs> Not that I just learned that it was in New Jersey. I'm just saying that, like, I don't know. I've always thought that was, like, interesting, like— Because, you know, New Jersey is, like, New York's ugly cousin. Oh. You're really coming for New Jersey. You've never even been to New—wait, have you been to New Jersey? No, I've never been to New Jersey. Yeah, I haven't either. No, I just know that, like, if people um, have—people that I've—I used to work in a travel agency a long time ago. 
And if they had a layover in Newark, New Jersey, they'd be like, New Jersey. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know why, though. It's just an airport. Like, what are you going to do? You, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Fuck you, Newark. That's what they said. <laughs> All right, so he went to Princeton. Colette started going to Skidmore College in upstate New York. I don't know, maybe Scarsdale. I don't know where it is. Uh, Yeah, who can know? Despite living in two different cities, McDonald and Colette were serious about each other. After her sophomore year at college, Colette discovered that she was pregnant, and of course, Jeffrey was the father. The couple decided to get married and were wed in New York City on September 14th, 1963. And their first daughter, Kimberly Catherine, was born on April 18th, 1964 in Princeton, New Jersey. That date, the just April 18th, means nothing to me. Well, mm-hmm. that was hurtful. Mm-hmm. That's my birthday, <laughs> if you guys don't know. So, but it does, like, I was thinking about this There are some little connections, you know, that like even something as simple as like, oh, we have the same birthday that same year, too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That like kind of I don't know. And I think you you understand what I'm trying to say makes the people in these cases more real because it's just a lot of times it sounds just like a story. But it's like you have to remember these are actual people. Mm-hmm. You know, she'd be in her 50s now. Mm-hmm. And she should be. Like, it's just it's just so sad. So she was born in April of 1964. She was a reserved little girl who loved school. She loved reading and drawing and was a very gentle child. And while she was always advanced in her milestones, Kimberly was not a take-charge girl and often needed coaxing to try new things. And she loved being a big sister. After McDonald completed three years at Princeton, his family moved to Chicago in 1964. He'd been accepted to Northwestern University Medal School. Med- oh, what's a medal school? I don't know. Maybe Welder? Oh, I was thinking like where you just get a lot of medals. That would be cool. Yeah, I want to go to that Gold school. medals for me, thanks. Exactly. Yeah, so that's actually medical school. Mm-hmm. and completed his undergraduate degree in medical school simultaneously. That's pretty, I mean, the things this man could have done. Right. And, I mean, he was said to have anything that he set his mind to, he could do it. Yeah. Except Which, being uh, faithful to his wife, apparently. Or, contrary-wise, if he set his mind to simply, what, not murdering his whole family? No, that's not what I'm saying. If you would oh. just let me finish. Let me guess. No, (laughs) I'm saying if you want to argue that he set his mind to massacring his entire family. Oh, and he did. See what I'm saying there? Yeah. 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 If that's the route you want to take, you know what I mean? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So while all this is going on, Colette found out that she was pregnant again and she was so excited. She gave birth to Kristen Jean on May 8th, 1967. Now, Kristen, unlike her sister, was wide open. She wasn't scared of anything. This feels very much like my two boys. Like, Ben is the older, and he's much more cautious. I mean, there was even one time I took them to a playground, a child's playground. And, you know, the little, like, tire swing thing, it was, like, hanging underneath the big, you know, where you would climb up and, like, slide down and all that stuff. So it's a pretty low tire swing thing. It's it's literally, like, a foot off the ground. And Ben and Jesse wanted to get on it, and so they were standing on it. And Ben the whole time is like, ah, are we sure this is a good idea? I don't know if we should be standing up here. And I'm like, baby, if you fall, you literally just, like, it's like you were standing up and you fell down, like— and there's mulch under you. You're not super high up. But he was just, like, always very cautious. And Jesse's never met a surface he won't jump off of. <laughs> like, he just I, assumes I'll be fine. But I wonder how much of that is, like, a birth order thing. Because while yeah. you are very take charge, you are way more cautious than I am. Like, mm-hmm. cautious maybe is not the right word. You are, you think about consequences. You d- yes. <laughs> I'm also You're, an Enneagram 6, which, you know. Or a scaredy, scaredy cat. And yeah, you always. Fear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, true crime was an interesting choice for me to make as far as a career. <laughs> I know. Talking about murder does not, I mean, while it's tragic and terrible, it doesn't scare you to the point that, let's say, I don't know, a stink bug would. Sure. It's well, just. they buzz. 
It's wild. They yeah. are loud bugs. They're very loud. Yeah, I don't like the buzzing. Um, so Kristen was never standing still. She was outgoing. She loved animals. She loved being outdoors. I would venture to say she's not afraid of bugs, even. I wouldn't think so. I know. In a book written after her death, the author described Kristen as, quote, a tiger. Hmm. So Jeffrey McDonald finished his surgical internship at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. They are all over the damn place. I know. At this time, the Vietnam War was in full swing, and after talking it over with his wife, he decided to enlist in the U.S. Army. After training, the family ended up at the Army base in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in August of 1969, not far from Fayetteville. McDonald had earned a coveted spot in the Army's Green Berets, which was a nickname for the Army's Special Forces. He was working as a surgeon on base, and for the first time since they were married, he had a reliable paycheck and a normal schedule. I mean, freaking residencies and shit for medical school? Right. That shit's fucking wild. I know. My favorite thing ever, side note, is when you say frickin' and then you go on to say an actual curse. Like, it's just so silly to me. Frickin' <laughs> shit was wild. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I don't curse all the time. Yeah, but... <laughs> some of the time. <laughs> like, you're the most interesting man in the world. I don't <laughs> curse you. all the time, but when I do... I... It's immediately after a non-curse word. Yes. To bleep it's, myself out. Yes. You've uh, immediately after I censored myself. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's better. That's that's the way to say it. Yep. So, you know, they're kind of settling into life on the army base. And I mean, how many times have we heard this? They seem to be the perfect all-American family. Mm. Which, of course, means... Shit's about to get... Always. Nuts, yes. Okay, so McDonald had even bought his daughters a little... Pony. Pony. Little pony. Yes. Yep, so they could say, my little pony. Yes, and guess what old McDonald had on his farm? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little pony. A little pony. <laughs> um, the family became close friends with Rick and Judy Thosen. I I'm not sure if that's correct either. Yes, we... I've watched... Torella, you've watched more on this than I have, but I did watch The People Investigates. It's um, season one, episode 11. And you meet the, I'm going to say those since I don't know, but they never say their names. You know, why would they be like, hi, I'm Rick yeah. and Judy. The, like, they, they don't say it. It's just, you know, on the screen as their names. But I'm like really hoping that they're going to get a given a pronunciation and they sure as shit don't. They never do, yeah. I, I, that is one thing I wish that, like, documentaries and stuff would change. It's like, tell them to say their names. I yeah. mean, and really, it's just for my benefit so that when I'm rehashing it in an episode, I feel like I've said it correctly. But, so I guess it's not really that necessary. But for us <laughs> podcasters who are trying to cover your docs, I, come on. I know. It would be helpful. And more lower thirds. Remind us who these people are. Yes, but I mean. 40 talking heads. But I will say that before we started doing this as a viewer, I'd be like, oh my God, we get it. Like, we know already. <laughs> I, don't, it, I always forget who people are. I don't forget, but I, I couldn't like write it down after. You know what I mean? Like, I know who I know who that person is. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if I'm like writing write notes on something, I'm like, okay, yeah. who was she? Yeah, most people aren't taking notes, are they? No, I wouldn't think so. Yeah, makes sense. So Rick and Judy both worked in the medical facility on base, and Judy said that McDonald and Colette were loving parents, and she said he loved his girls. They had everything going for them at that point. And here's where we take a turn. Yep. In 1969, it was a difficult year for the United States. The summer of love was considered to be over, and the Vietnam War was still taking the lives of many American soldiers. A lot of the soldiers were returning to the United States, struggling with mental health issues and drug addictions. McDonald was encountering a lot of these soldiers on base, but he was known to be very unpopular with them. He refused to prescribe drugs to the soldiers who had addictions, and that caused a lot of tension on base. Cool. Just make them suffer more. Right. Like, oh, thank you for your service, but um, I'm not going to help you at all. So see yourself out. Yeah, exactly. On February 16th, 1970, Jeffrey came home to his on-base one-story apartment on Castle Drive, and the area where the family lived was patrolled by military police and reserved for married officers. He arrived home at around 5 p.m., which was not 
unusual for him. And he ended up taking Kimberly and Kristen to feed and play with the pony he'd bought them a few months prior for Christmas. The girls had named the pony Trooper, and they returned to the residence around 5.45 p.m., where Jeffrey showered, and then he changed into his PJs, his jams. At 5.45, this is a legit jammy outfit. It's like the matching top and uh, bottom, the blue uh, with the button-down shirt. 5.45. I mean, I'm not saying I've never done it, but he's getting pretty fucking comfy at 5.45. Hey, that's the dream, in my opinion. I guess. I don't know. I feel like like when I get into my jammies, I'm like, no, I'm going to go into bed. <laughs> like, there's no more day for me. I honestly might change the bottoms depending on what type of dinner I've had. If my if my, my blue jeans are fit, fitting a little t- snug, you know, I'm like, I'm going to go put on some jam pants because I can't, sure. I need my belly to breathe here. But um, yeah, I mean, you're right. At 545 is fairly early. Yeah, but just a little early. I mean, not to say you can't do it, but like... We are more likely to change into comfy clothes when we get home if, for whatever reason, like, the boys are, like, at a sleepover with y'all or something, if we're going to be able to lounge. Yeah. Um, But with two young kids, there's no lounging allowed. No. There's simply not time for it, so I just found it interesting. He probably was lounging. I mean, this is the 70s, so. Right. Even though he's got two young children, he's not. Anyway. That's not his job. So, yeah. After dinner— Colette uh, left the home for an evening class she was taking to get her teaching degree. Jeffrey put Kristen to bed around seven, and then he took a nap for about an hour. After waking up, he and five-year-old Kimberly watched her favorite TV show, Laugh-In. What and was she he, doing during that time? Uh, entertaining her. It's not, it's not a his five-year-old? business <laughs> like, what she I, was doing. If I was like, okay, I'm just going to go to sleep now. Don't fucking burn anything down or disappear out of the house. Like, well, See, now you're just giving them ideas. Well, yeah, that's true. Like, what, yeah, what is a five-year-old doing on her own? He's like, I, I'm just going to lay down for an hour. Not possible, like, watch, sir. Watch the news. I'm yeah. gonna Yeah. I have, I don't know what she was doing, but this is what happened, okay? I'm just reporting facts. I just don't like him. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, and that's your prerogative, and that's fine. So anyway, they watch Laughing, then he puts her to bed. Colette, who was pregnant with the couple's third child, came home around 940. Around, or she's about five. No, why can't I say I get Any four numbers. and five mixed? Yeah. No, yes. Okay. So she's okay. about four and a half months pregnant at that point, And she was super excited because she was carrying their first son of the family. Mm-hmm. So they sat down. They watched The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. Colette didn't last long. I don't blame her. Nope. If you're out of class, especially if I'm getting home oh at 940. Gosh, no. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Right. So she goes to bed shortly after the show starts. Jeffrey finished the show. Then he read a novel for a little bit. I mean, and he's well rested at this point. He's had a nap. He has absolutely had a nap. That's why he put on his jams because he needed his nap. Mm, yep, yep, yep. You're right. You're right. So, yes. He finished the show. He read his novel for a little bit. And then Kristen woke up crying. And Jeffrey went to her room and calmed her down with a bottle of chocolate milk. Yum. That's how you do it. That is one way to get your kid to shut STFU. <laughs> Like, here, exactly. have some chocolate milk. I know. It would get me. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm a 35, it. almost 35-year-old baby. Like, sure. it'll work for me, too. Exactly. When you wake up crying, I just shove chocolate milk down your throat. <laughs> and I am grateful for it. Exactly. So Kristen goes back to sleep. Jeffrey finishes his book around 2 a.m. He goes to wash the dirty dishes from their dinner that night, and then he heads into the bedroom and goes to sleep for the night. I just, it, does he really help this much around the house normally? I would be shocked if he did. I know. It just seems very, especially in the 70s, it does not matter that his wife is pregnant, they have two other kids, and she's in school. I mean, there are just so many. I just feel like for the time, you know, I don't like to use the term helping with the kids or helping around the house for a person who fucking lives there and makes the mess and eats the food and they're his children, you know? But... During that time, I mean, I don't know. It just seems like it's unusual for him to do that much stuff. Get yeah. up and go do the dishes at two in the morning. Right. But you know what? 
it's not unusual for oh. him to have extramarital affairs. Well, that's true. So maybe it's guilty conscience. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Also, but anyway, maybe none of this actually happened. I mean, well, this know. is coming from him and this is his exactly. his story and he's sticking to it. I don't know. I was just working, working, working. Yep. Busy, busy, busy. Mm-hmm. So he goes to head to his bedroom to go to sleep. But when he gets to his room, he finds that two-year-old Kristen is sleeping in his bed with Colette and she had wet the bed. So Jeffrey carries Kristen back to her bedroom and then he doesn't want to disturb Colette while she's sleeping to change the sheet. So he grabs a blanket and he goes to sleep on the couch in the living room. All according to him, by the way. So he says that he fell asleep quickly after laying down. And then sometime in the early morning hours of the 17th, Jeffrey said that he was awakened suddenly by Colette and Kimberly screaming. And he said that his, so Colette is shouting, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? And Kimberly is shouting, daddy, daddy, daddy. So he's still on the couch. He opens his eyes and he says that he sees four figures standing in the living room. He sees two white men, one black man in an army fatigue jacket with E6 sergeant stripes on the sleeve. And then he sees a woman with long blonde hair and a floppy hat. Now, one might ask, why would Colette scream, why are they doing this to me if all of the people in question are not doing anything to her at that point? Right. He says he's woken up by her screaming mid-attack, and he opens his eyes, and now, all of a sudden, all four of these people are in front of him in the fucking living room. Yeah. How did they get past him? I don't know. I don't know. And in if this home intruder type of situation, and of course, we'll get into more of it a little bit later, but if this is what has happened, it would make more sense that— whoever is coming in would take out the most, the biggest threat to you, right? So that would be the husband who is a former Green Beret or is a Green Beret. And he's on the couch all by himself. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying it just, it's not adding up. It doesn't make sense even to at this point. Mm -hmm. So he also said that the woman held a lit candle in front of her face and she's chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Okay. Let's just, I don't know. So Jeffrey says that he tried to get up off the couch, but he was immediately struck with a club by the uh, black male. He was stabbed multiple times with what he believed was an ice pick. And during the struggle, Jeffrey said that his pajama top was basically pulled off and put onto his wrists. And the men continued to strike him until he lost consciousness. When Jeffrey regained consciousness, he stumbled into the master bedroom to find his wife covered in blood and unresponsive. And he said that he tried to perform mouth to mouth. And every time he did that, blood bubbled out of her chest. So he used his pajama top to cover Colette's upper body. And then he made his way into his daughter's bedrooms and saw that both of the girls were unfortunately dead at this point. So he goes back to the master bedroom and was able to get to the phone and make a call before he goes unconscious again and he's laying next to Colette. At 3.42 a.m., 911 dispatchers received a phone call from the McDonald residence reporting that there had been a stabbing. Military police respond, thinking that they're walking into a domestic violence situation, but when they got there, they found an absolutely horrific scene. So they enter the home and they find 26-year-old Colette lying on the floor of her bedroom covered in blood, and she was dead at the scene with 16 knife wounds to the chest and neck and 21 wounds in the chest from an ice pick that had been pushed to the hilt of the pick and had she had been hit at least six times with some sort of object on the head. Both of her arms are broken. Mm. This was a brutal, violent attack. Her husband's pajama top was draped over her chest, and Jeffrey is lying next to her on the floor with his arm around her. And he's unconscious, but he is alive. So when Jeffrey wakes up, he immediately asked about his family, and he was like, are the kids safe? Military police continued to the kids' rooms to find two more devastating scenes. So five-year-old Kimberly was laying on her bed in a pool of her own blood. She had been struck in the head with an uh, object multiple times, and one of the strikes shattered her skull. Mm. Another strike on the left side of her face was so forceful that it left shards of bone sticking through the skin by her eye. She had also been stabbed several times in the neck with a knife. Kristen, who was two, was also lying dead in her bed. She had a total of 33 stab wounds to her chest, back, and neck, 
The wounds were made by a knife and an ice pick, and one of her fingers was cut to the bone, which suggested that she was trying to protect herself while this attack is happening. The only survivor of the entire McDonald family is 26-year-old Jeffrey. Okay. So Jeffrey is taken to the hospital with minor injuries from a knife. A surgeon on staff said that the most serious of McDonald's wounds was a, quote, clean, sharp, nope, clean, small, sharp laceration on the right side of his chest, which did cause a partial deflation of his right lung. But he said this is easily fixed. So it's not, the way they're making it sound, that's not life-threatening at all. Right, it's like tis but a flesh wound. Yeah. And you know what that's reminding me of? Henry Van Breda. Mm Mm-hmm. His family is all brutally murdered with an axe, and he has, like, some cuts on him. Yeah. Why? It's suspicious. I mean, you've got a paper cut, and everybody else is— Yeah, anytime there's a large discrepancy between victims of a violent crime, and you've got victims who were brutally, brutally attacked, and then you have somebody who has minor wounds— And is in no danger of death at all. It's not like it's a miracle he survived. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's suspicious. Um, McDonald told police his account of what happened earlier that morning with the four strangers who'd broken into his home, attacked him, and murdered his family. He described them multiple times as, quote, drug-crazed hippies. He denied having any enemies in the community, but it was brought up that he was particularly hard on drug users on base, like we said. It wasn't long before the Criminal Investigation Department CID unit of the Army arrived on scene. William Ivory was the first agent on scene and found himself bothered by multiple things that he just felt didn't add up between what Jeffrey is telling them and what he's seeing at the murder scene. The living room, except for a knocked-over plant and coffee table, looked untouched. And the coffee table was turned over on its side. It didn't flip all the way over. It was standing on its side. Well, and the knocked over plant, it, the the pot of the plant is upright, but the plant itself is taken out of the pot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's very Riddle odd. Riddle me that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, other than those two items, there were no obvious signs of a struggle. And McDonald says, this is violent. And there's four intruders, plus the members of the family, in a one-level apartment. Mm -hmm. and nothing else is knocked over. There was even, like, all these, um, there were cards. You know, like, when you get a card and you want to, like, set it up for display or whatever, you kind of, you know, open it up a little bit, and there it stands. There were cards on the coffee table or some other table, like not the coffee table, like an end table or something, where the girls had given their dad Valentine's Day cards shortly before this, and all of those cards were still standing exactly as they were. I don't know. How would that not get knocked over if you're just, like, having this, like, fight to the death? I mean, a ceiling fan would take those out. Exactly. Yeah. They were only able to find one fiber from his pajama top in the living room, but that's where he claimed he received all of his stab wounds. However, there were multiple fibers located in the master bedroom and in both of the girls' rooms. Some were found beneath Colette's body, under Kimberly's sheets, and one underneath Kristen's fingernail. And police found it strange since McDonald had said he'd already taken off his pajama top when he'd gone into the girls' rooms to check on them. There was a significant amount of blood found in the bedrooms, but none on the living room floor. Jeffrey's glasses were found in the living room with a small speck of blood on them, and that was found to belong to Kristen. But McDonald had said earlier that he was not wearing his glasses when he entered either of the girls' bedrooms. So he's in there with no glasses, no shirt, but their blood is on both of those items. Another strange finding at the scene was that the word pig was written in blood on the headboard in the master bedroom. And this eerily echoed the Manson murders of the Tate and LaBiancas that had occurred only six months earlier. Underneath the headboard, tips of surgical gloves were found. These glove tips were found to be identical to gloves that were kept in the cabinet below the kitchen sink in the McDonald home. Just beside the cabinet, there were several drops of blood that matched McDonald's blood type. But at this point, we can only tell blood type, right? We don't have DNA testing like we have now. So how do we know that it's actually McDonald's blood type? Couldn't it be his other family members? 
Mm. No, because <laughs> guess what? McDonald was unaware of this at the time, but every single member of member of his family had a different blood type. So it was literally like drawing a map and being like Kristen blood here, Kimberly blood here, Colette blood here, and Jeffrey blood here. Mm-hmm. You could tell exactly who was who and exactly where everything happened. And honestly, I mean, thank God that that is the case that everybody had different blood types because how difficult would it have been to pinpoint that? Because like you said, this is 1970. We don't have the DNA testing that mm-hmm. we had. So yeah, Exactly. Outside the home near the back door, investigators found an ice pick, a kitchen knife, and a piece of wood covered in blood about the size of a baseball bat. And they determined that, what? They called it, they referred to it because I was like a piece of wood. I wonder what that looked like. They referred to it as a club. Hmm. So. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and all of these items were used in the murders, but all three of them had come from the McDonald home. Or back to the Van Berda thing. Yeah. Here's a question. And this is going to sound stupid of me, but I mean. Well, I mean, if the shoe fits, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not a steel trap over here. The Manson murders. Sure. Did they bring their own knife? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. I I don't, I could, I didn't remember them just finding whatever was at the house. They went there with a plan to kill people and they brought weapons in order to do that. Mm-hmm. Is it? impossible that an intruder will use something already in the home? No, it's not. It You know, if somebody is going there just to commit a robbery and then they find people at home that they didn't expect to find home and maybe they get spooked or whatever, you know, it's just, it's unlikely. Well, because now you're wasting, and I hope you guys understand what I mean when I say valuable seconds. If I, if I'm talking specifically about a, a perpetrator, right? Mm-hmm. They're thinking we're wasting valuable seconds looking, going through the kitchen looking for a knife or going right. through the whatever and looking for an ice pick, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, how do you know, you know, where you're going to, where you're going to find those things? Unless it's a perpetrator that is familiar with the home. Right. You know, like say Candy, Montgomery, Betty Gore, she knew where everything was in the garage and, you know, all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Like, it's not that it can't happen. It's just, I mean, three specific items that were that belong to them. Yeah. And you also have to think this took place on a freaking army base. A freaking army base. I know. Like, and I do think, I mean, all of these things that we're talking about stand alone, maybe, you know, like, well, that's kind of weird, but I don't know. But when you put it all together. Yeah, I mean, the security on an army base is going to be much better than just your typical neighborhood, you know, or apartment complex. Like, I I would think it'd be very difficult for just an intruder to just drive up and be, you know, case it and whatever. Exactly. And it's it's patrolled regularly, so. Yeah, and I don't know how it was then to get on and off the base, but I do know now, like, we— have a friend whose husband is in the Navy and they lived on the Navy base for a while. And when we went to visit, I mean, you had to wait in a line. They had to you check like your have ID. To get clearance. Yeah. Yeah. You had to, they had to take down your information. They had to write down your license plate number. Like you weren't getting on that base without being tracked. Right. So, and again, I don't know if, if this situation was like that. I'm just saying it just seems like you'd be facing more security. It seems like, um, a poor decision for a random, quote, drug-crazed hippie to be like, let's get on the base, dude. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. Jeffrey McDonald reportedly told investigators three times shortly after the attacks that he had taken the knife out of his wife's chest. They weren't sure why McDonald was so fixated on getting this specific point across to police. It was also noted um, that later tests indicated that the knife had never been in Colette's chest. According to a Vanity Fair article about the murders, the CID used the paths of blood and evidence to create a likely scenario of what happened that night. And they theorized that the attacks began in the master bedroom with some sort of a trigger stemming from an insult to McDonald's masculinity. We are stretching here. Mm -hmm. You don't fucking know that. (laughs) No. But, like, just say it, it started in the bedroom. But, like, I hate when they do shit like that, when they're like, well, we think she overheard him saying something that she wasn't supposed to hear. And therefore, he got angry when she confronted— You don't know any of that shit happened. Mm-mm. Like, 
We don't know what happened, but anyway. I mean, for them to use it in a trial or to use it for an arrest warrant or something like that is awful. I get pissed even when somebody tries to use that shit in a docu-series about the case. I'm like, yeah. y'all, but y'all don't know that. You don't know that. <laughs> like, I do believe that Jeffrey McDonald killed his family, but I'm not willing to say what started the argument because we have no evidence of that. If they found a letter where, you know, Colette had written something, you know, like, okay, sure. but we didn't find that. Like, Or, I mean, if you have more evidence piecing that kind of stuff together, like, we'll get into it, but let's say she found out about affairs that he affair. had been having. Yeah. That, yeah, that would make and more then sense. she was planning on possibly leaving, you know, yeah, okay, exactly. let's go with that, but. Yeah, but there's literally no shit up is just this. ridiculous, yeah. Yeah, so his masculinity has been insulted. This is unacceptable to him. So they fought, and then they said they think Colette hit her husband in the forehead with a hairbrush. I'm not really sure why they think that. They believe that he then struck Colette in the head with the wooden board that had been inside for use with household chores. What do you use a club for? I don't know. They're saying a board, though. I don't know what you would even use a board for. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't know. For what you chores. Use I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. The oldest daughter, Kimberly, was awoken by the commotion and walked into her parents' room where she was also struck by the board. Investigators believed this hit might have been inadvertently, that like maybe she kind of was walking into the room and he didn't know she was there and he was swinging it back to hit Colette and hit Kimberly in the head. Her blood was found on, oh wait, I skipped a line, sorry. Kimberly's brain matter was found in the doorway of the master bedroom. McDonald, assuming that his wife was dead, carried Kimberly back to her bedroom and killed her there. Her blood was found on McDonald's pajama top that, remember, he said he was not wearing when he went into their bedrooms. McDonald believed that he had to kill the last, quote, witness, so he made his way to his youngest daughter, Kristen's room. Before McDonald killed Kristen, Colette came into the room severely injured but still alive, and she, they believe, she threw herself over Kristen, who was laying in her bed. Colette's blood was found on Kristen's bed comforter and on one of the walls in her bedroom. In McDonald's story, Colette never goes into this room. Right. Um, so Jeffrey proceeds to kill both of them in Kristen's room. He then wraps Colette's body in a sheet and carries her back to the bedroom. There was a footprint in Colette's blood on the way out of Kristen's bedroom. There were no bloody footprints leaving the master bedroom, only the one exiting Kristen's room. So that makes sense for investigators, it does not make sense for Jeffrey's story. Exactly. Because he's saying that he left the master bedroom after finding Colette and basically believing that there's nothing else he could do and then going into Kristen and Kimberly's rooms. Right. I have to make it look like somebody broke in. Also, I read that um, the autopsy report showed that, because remember he said he wakes up or he's getting ready to go to bed or whatever, and fine, after he does all the dishes, of course, between the morning. Right, right, well, yes. That Kristen is sleeping in the bed with Colette, but she had unfortunately wet the bed, so he carried her back to her bedroom, and then he goes to sleep on the couch. But they said that the autopsy report showed that the urine that was on the master bedroom bed belonged to Kimberly. So the thought is, and the evidence shows that Kimberly is the person who wet the bed. Is this during the attack? You know, that's possible. Because because when you're sometimes yeah, when you're being your attacked. bowels evacuate, you're, you know. Yeah. So, but it's interesting because like I read, you know, that some people theorized um that he lied and said it was Kristen that had wet the bed because he's that much of a narcissist that he couldn't admit that his older child still wet the bed. And so he told police She's it was the younger five. one. She's five. Oh, yeah. my God. Like, because he couldn't handle that. Right. Um, but for what, what, I mean, whatever the reason, it was, from what I understand, it was not Kristen that wet the bed. So strange that that's, okay. Yeah. So after brutally murdering his entire family, the CID believed that Jeffrey started his cover-up. Strangely enough, there was a copy of Esquire magazine in the living room with multiple articles about the Manson murders. I don't know. This is another one of those things that, like, didn't the prosecution in the Andrea Yates case say 
that she got the idea to drown her children from some episode of some TV show that she watched. And then they found out that like, maybe she never even watched it. Like, yeah, everybody like knew some, about the Manson shit was all over the place. CSI kind of, yeah, exactly. Well, and yeah. I mean, we can bring up again, Betty Gore, like mm-hmm. the shining situation. And right. yeah, you no, know. I mean, maybe, maybe he saw that magazine and was like, wait a second. But they think that there's all these articles and he gets the bright idea to make it look like a copycat Manson murder. So they theorized, theorized, that he took a disposable scalpel from medical supplies that he had in a closet and he cut himself between the ribs. He then put on a pair of his surgical gloves and wrote pig on the headboard in Colette's blood. It's just disgusting. Mm -hmm. He removed his pajama top and laid it on top of his wife, then stabbed through it several times with the ice pick. He then used the phone to call for help before either flushing the gloves and scalpel or throwing them in the garbage. Um, We don't know which of those happened, if either, because the garbage was discarded before the CID went through it. That's just great. Yeah, perfect. I was hoping they would not go, not collect any of the garbage. and right. Or, or secure hoping, the crime scene. Yeah, I was going to say, I was hoping that they, they wouldn't secure the crime scene, if, but at all. Yeah. Wish granted. Yeah. Jeffrey McDonald, of course, denied any of this, and he stuck to his story about the four intruders. With the amount of evidence that the CID allowed to be destroyed on scene, it would be difficult to prove what happened. So, like we were just saying, they didn't seal off the house. 26 people walked through the home before they secured it. Did they do tours of the crimes? Like, why? I'm sorry, is that not protocol? Hey, everybody, get a tour, get your tour before we seal it off. Yep. I don't Come on. understand. This included an ambulance driver who stole McDonald's wallet from the scene. <sighs> now we've got multiple crime scenes in the same crime scene. It's just... Mm-hmm. And like one of the detectives or like one of the police officers that walked through, you know, that... um the plant that had been, quote, knocked over, he picked it up and fixed it. He, he was just, he couldn't, you know, I can't deal with that. That's, I got to pick this up. I could honestly see myself. I mean, it would take everything in me not to go, if I'm in someone's bathroom, I don't care what whose bathroom it is. It does not matter what's happening. I don't care why I'm there. If the toilet paper roll is not on correctly, in my uh-huh. opinion, I'm going to fix it. Yeah. Yeah, he, he like, couldn't let it go. And the um, military police officer that was there, the detective, was like, what the fuck are you doing? Don't touch that. But, like, by then, it's already been touched. Mm -hmm. Everything's, I mean, they just, they contaminated this crime scene. Like, there is no, no way to actually describe how contaminated this crime scene was. I mean, it was just fucking ridiculous. Um, They lost a blue fiber that was found beneath Kristen's fingernail and a piece of skin found underneath Colette's fingernail. That is incredibly important evidence. Incredibly important. A CID allowed a doctor to turn over Colette's body and move the pajama top that was lying on top of her. 40 sets of fingerprints were destroyed along with the bloody footprint. 40. 40. 40. Okay. Okay. So this is the thing. This is why there's still so much, I mean, you know, kind of like a cloud surrounding this case. If they'd done anything to secure this crime scene... Jean Bonnet. Yes. <sighs> Three months after the murders, an Article 32 hearing was held to determine whether the court-martial would proceed with charges against Jeffrey. It described or It's described as a proceeding similar to a grand jury or pre- preliminary hearing. And this was the largest Article 32 hearing in the history of the U.S. Army. The attorney hired by Jeffrey McDonald's mother was reportedly very taken aback by Jeffrey's lack of emotion about the murders. The attorney had him evaluated by a psychiatrist who reported, quote, possibly some latent homosexual conflicts and, quote, some narcissistic need to be famous or infamous. What? What? Yeah, there you go. What? The psychiatrist said that he was, quote, fairly certain that McDonald hadn't murdered his family. Why? Fairly certain is not good enough for me, even if you have a reason. But because we cannot, as people, you can't evaluate somebody as a psychiatrist, I don't think, and be like, he did not do it. 
because you don't know. Exactly. But whatever. So Jeffrey's defense brought forth several character witnesses, including Colette's stepfather, Freddie. So shortly after, Freddie announced a $5,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the real killers. And during the hearing, a man came to Jeffrey's lawyer to tell him about a neighbor he had while living in nearby Fayetteville. Okay, and this is after an award is announced, a reward. An award. <laughs> yes, I know. I can't stop with awards right now, I guess. I know. But you know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah. Now, now there's then, incentive for somebody to provide a... Yeah, a and that's a risk you take. Suspect. You know, because you do need information, and sometimes rewards ha- coax somebody who has information that is, you know, it's apprehensive sad. about coming forward, but... sure. Yeah, it's sad that people need the the monetary gain to do the right thing. But if you're scared or something, I told, I get it. But at the yeah. same time, it's just like then you you open the door for people who just want the money. So exactly, yeah. And so this woman was um, known as Helena, and she was heavily into drugs. On the night of the murders, the man recalled that he got up around 4 a.m. to use the bathroom, and he saw a Mustang pulling into the driveway next door with Helena and a few men. A few weeks later, the man said that Helena told him that she was going to leave town because she believed, or the police believed that she had been involved in the McDonald murders. And she said that she'd been so high that night that she could not remember what she'd done. Officer Kenneth Micah was called to the stand by the defense to tell them what he'd seen that night while en route to the McDonald house. He said that he saw a female standing on the corner of the street about four or five blocks from the McDonald's home wearing a dark coat and a wide-brimmed hat. He believed her to be between 20 and 30 years old, and Micah said that he reported this to a supervisor on the scene of the murders once he'd heard McDonald describing a woman as one of the intruders. Police were very familiar with the woman, Helena, um, that the man had been described, uh, had described living next door to him. So her name is Helena Stockley. She was 18 and she was, in fact, a heavy drug user. She was interviewed a few days after the murders and investigations, or investigators said that she provided no useful information except to say that she was positive, that she was never in the McDonald home, and that she had no longer had the floppy hat or the blonde wig. Yeah, and in the um, docuseries, A Wilderness of Error, or just Wilderness of Error, I don't remember. Um, they interview the military police that arrived on scene. And this guy, I think Micah, who said, I saw somebody. And he said he told his supervisors about it, that he'd seen a woman while they were going to the McDonald home. And everybody kind of brushed it off. But he also said, it wasn't Helena. I knew her. I was familiar with her, and it was mm-hmm. not her. It was another woman, but I saw a woman, but it was not her. Right. I don't know. <sighs> the colonel that presided over the hearing felt that the accounts of Helena being involved in the murders gave too much question to Jeffrey's guilt, and he recommended that police investigate Helena further and determine that the charges against Jeffrey were not true. All right. So Jeffrey McDonald is given an honorable discharge from the army and he tried to get his life together. So this included selling most of his family's things in a yard sale. He never even took like those Valentine's Day cards that his girls had made him. They Mm. stayed at the house because the the house stayed this way. And it's like nine years later when he goes to trial, they actually took the jury to the home to walk through it. And everything is still just as it was. Wow. Those cards were still there. I know. I'm not going to say, like, this is all, you can speculate one way or the other, right? Like, I have, our grandfather, after our Nana passed away, granddaddy was just so grief-stricken that he was like, take it all. I don't want any of it. Because he he was just sad. Yeah. I mean, he wanted some pictures and things like that, but he just, you know, get rid of everything. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. He didn't care. It could happen, mm-hmm. but... That's not the only thing that is making me question. Right. And I'll just say that, so. Exactly. He moved to New York, uh, reportedly to look for a journalist to sell his story to. See, don't like that. Nope. He made an appearance on the Dick Cavett Show and spoke more about the Army's supposed attempt to go after him rather than talking about his family. And if you watch that appearance, he's making jokes. He's, you know, again, not to say that you can't make jokes when you're uncomfortable or you're grieving or anything like that. It's just, if you watch that appearance, it does not 
you don't see a man who is grieving his family. It just doesn't look that way. No, I mean, he honestly, I mean, a lot of people have said that after that appearance, he looked, he came across as very arrogant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he definitely did. And he was. I mean, everybody Mm -hmm. who knew him pretty much was like, yeah, he was arrogant. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, so I don't know. But Freddie, Colette's stepfather, um, initially was very, very supportive of Jeffrey McDonald. And even when, you know, the media would ask him, like, hey, you know, there's some suspicion that he may have done this. What do you think about that? Like, in one interview, he even said, you know, even after all this, if I could choose my own son-in-law, I would still choose Jeffrey. Like, he was very supportive of him. But all of these things happening, he's starting to have some questions. And McDonald ends up telling Freddie that he and the other Green Berets had found one of the real killers and, quote, took care of him. Okay. But he also finally gives Freddie access to the transcripts of the Article 32 hearing because Freddie doesn't know anything about what happened in that hearing, right? Right. And he had been asking for them for a long time. A long time. And McDonald kept saying, like, oh, you don't need those. Don't worry about those. Like, whatever. For whatever reason, he finally gives him these transcripts. And he goes through everything in detail. Freddie is not the kind of person who's going to be like, oh, okay, well, he gave it to me, so he must be telling the truth. No, he read that shit. And he started finding inconsistencies with his testimony. And he made his way to the home where his daughter and granddaughters were murdered, and he started going over everything in the home. And at this point, he's just like, this is not adding up. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Meanwhile, Jeffrey McDonald has moved to California where he began working as an emergency room physician at St. Mary Medical Center in Long Beach. He bought a yacht, he bought a sports car, and it wasn't long before he was dating again. Unbeknownst to McDonald, the CID had continued investigating him. See, I think that the reason why he he ended up giving the transcripts is because he was like, well, I'm home free. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. I have nothing to lose here. Yeah. So they found that the McDonald's marriage was very rocky, that he'd had at least 15 girlfriends. 15 15. girlfriends. A family member— They've been married for five years. Yes. Yes. A family member said that Colette was aware of the affairs and had told her that she didn't want to do this anymore, referring to her marriage. And she said that when McDonald told Colette of an upcoming three-month traveling assignment, Colette had called her mother, and she was like, look, I'm coming home with the kids. And this was just a few days before the murders. And I saw an interview with her mom, and it is so sad. And she said, I told Colette to stay there and stick it out and make it work, to try to make it work, you know? And she feels felt so guilty about that. I mean, how could she know? Uh, There are also reports that the day after Kimberly was born that uh, Jeffrey McDonald left his wife and baby in the hospital to travel to visit his high school girlfriend. Wow. Yeah. He also admitted to having a sexual relationship with the wife of one of his peers in medical school. And he later made excuses for his indiscretion, saying that, quote, he wasn't doing anything unusual. It was 68, 70, and a lot of things were exploding. I like women, and I wasn't thinking of the consequences. I had a high testosterone. What's he supposed to do? Have blue balls? Like, are you kidding me? That's or fuck his wife. threatening. Right. Gross. Right. right. Like, and I'm not saying, like, if she doesn't want to, I'm just saying, like, did it not occur to you to maybe, like, work on your relationship with your wife rather than just, like, I have high testosterone. It's 68 and 70. Everybody's doing it. I gotta get it, it in where I can. Yeah, exactly. It's like, And see, this is another reason why I'm like, you did not get up and do the fucking dishes at 2 in the morning. Right. Like, no, the way you that, did not. No, the way that he talks about himself. Mm-hmm. at the times and like all these things it's just I'm like yeah there's no way that he was this like stand up husband who was like it's our responsibility together yeah and also he was asked at one point did you think you were a faithful husband and he mm-hmm. said quote well I certainly wasn't sexually faithful I felt in my heart that I was emotionally faithful to Colette okay um, gold star yeah way to go <laughs> That's all that matters. What's whatever you feel in your heart. That's all that matters. Exactly. So, I mean, it would make more sense that, like you said, they got in an argument because he was about to leave on this trip and she knew that he was going to go be with other women. And she said, 
that's it. I'm leaving and I'm taking the kids and whatever. And they get into a fight about this. And then he goes to hit her. Kimberly walks in the room because she hears them yelling. He hits her too. And then he's like, well, I've just got to kill everybody now. Right. Just rather than Colette made a comment that insulted his masculinity. So then she hits him with a hairbrush. And then he grabs a board that is used for basic household needs. And then, like, it's just, I mean, we got enough there. We don't need all of this extra fluff and stuff. Where do you do. keep your household board? Um, Mine is in the shop right now. Mm. Yeah, we call it the chore board. Yes, it's the you chore know? board. Yeah, every I day like when the that. boys get home, I'm like, go get your chore boards. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure there's something that we're missing, but I just don't get it. Yeah. Especially because they're referring to it as a board rather than a club. I don't even know if what you could use a club for for household chores. Yeah. Chore club. I don't know. Yeah. We probably spent too much time on the chore board, but um, all right. Helena Stokely was never found to have any involvement in these murders. Her DNA was never found at the scene. She was, again, a heavy drug user. Um, She was also an informant for police and was known to just say whatever police wanted her to say so that you know what I think she was a two an Enneagram two yes she wanted to please exactly she was just like whatever you guys want me to do I want to be able I want you to say that I'm doing a good job so nothing was ever found to link her to the scene her DNA was nowhere her hair was nowhere um there were no I don't even think they found any wig hairs anywhere you know so she was like never linked to anything yeah so In 1974, a grand jury was uh, convened in Raleigh, North Carolina. They spent seven months reviewing evidence, listening to testimonies, and they finally indicted Jeffrey on three counts of murder. His attorney, defense attorney, was able to get the charges thrown out, saying that they denied him the right to a speedy trial. But in 77, the Supreme Court announced that it would hear the government's appeal regarding the charges. So these charges were reinstated, and a jury selection began in 79. And one of the reasons why they thought that it, it, he won, Jeffrey won the Article 32 hearing was because prosecution didn't provide a motive. But this time, they did have a motive. You know, albeit. it's Well, like uh, now, yeah, now they're saying he flew into a rage because of the child wetting the bed. Right. And he kills Kimberly, kills Colette, and then he to make the intruder story look plausible, he's got to go ahead and kill Kristen as well. But anyway, so... They end up trying him for these murders, and the jury took six hours to come to a decision, and Jeffrey was shocked completely when he was found guilty of two counts of second-degree murder for uh, Colette and Kimberly, and then first-degree murder for Kristen. Mm -hmm. The judge asks Jeffrey if he had anything to say. And he said that he wasn't guilty and that he didn't feel like the jury had heard all of the evidence. But the judge sentenced him to the maximum sentence, which is three consecutive life sentences. Now, the in 1980, they did reverse his conviction because of the right to a speedy trial that they say he was, you know, he did not have access to, like it was violated. But But, like, they're saying because it was a nine-year delay to take him to trial, but isn't it from the time that you're charged to the time that you're brought to trial? Like, he wasn't charged the year of the murders. Uh Uh-uh. Unless you're counting the Article 32. Yeah, which was, like, undecided. Like, it was just, like, there's not enough evidence here. So how is that? I just don't. I don't don't either. I don't either. But, I mean, regardless of that, so he ends up getting released on bail. He goes back to California. But the Supreme Court ruled that he had, you know, the, his right to a speedy trial had not been violated. So they rearrested him on March 31st, 1982. In January of 1983, Helena Stockley died of natural causes. Jeffrey never was able to pick her out of a lineup. Um, so we, it, I don't understand, you know, whatever. It doesn't seem like she was connected to it. But he ended up being back in prison for the murders. And in 1991, he was eligible for parole, but he didn't apply. Um, Then in 1997, he had some 
DNA on hair and blood evidence tested at the scene. He does apply for parole in 2005, but during the parole hearing, he refused to admit any guilt. He said that he was factually innocent, so his parole was denied. Mm -hmm. In March of 2006, the DNA results come back from the testing, and they find no evidence of Helena or her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, being at the scene. And (laughs) the defense team said that there was a mystery hair on Colette's hand, and they said that it— It would have been from an intruder, but Mm -hmm. DNA testing found out that it was actually from Jeffrey. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. So in 2007, um, Jeffrey's defense team filed an affidavit on behalf of Helena's mother where she said that Helena confessed twice that she was at the house of the night, the night of the murders. Um, The thing is, I mean, he's, he's still in jail. He still continues to deny any involvement. He ended up marrying his prison pen pal in 2002. Her name is Catherine. She's doing everything she can to profess his innocence to try to get him out of jail. She even tweeted Donald Trump. He completely ignored it. And, you know, there are so many things that— This case is so heavy. We could have talked about this for episode on episode on episode. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, he is 77. He is— still incarcerated. He's at uh, in Cumberland, Maryland at their federal correctional institution and he has not been released, so. Nope. So, I don't know. Let us know what you guys think. We always have an Instagram post uh, for our weekly releases, so you can go there and let us know what you think. Like, do you think that Jeffrey McDonald did this? Um, since it is an older case too, like, how do you think it would have been um, done today? Investigated differently, and you know, and obviously, not securing the scene is a huge misstep and makes a huge difference in the outcome. But do you think they got it right? Right, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for listening. We love you guys so much, and we hope to catch you on the next episode. But we will, you know, we'll let you go for now. But bye. Bye. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening, and we will meet you back here next week. Bye! The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloan Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at killerqueenspodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. 